There we go. Cool, splendid. Okay, uh, hello everyone, my name is Mark and I'll be giving the first talk today. Um, in one of the reviews of this talk, it said um, this talk is too much like a game dev blog. I think of that as being a strength rather than a weakness, although the person clearly didn't mean it as that. And uh, this talk is basically about what I'm calling qualitative PCG, which is a particular kind of approach to PCG that I use in the game I make in my spare time outside of my uh, academic work. And I'm going to start this talk with a few um, disclaimers, I think, based on some recent talks I've given with the same kind of content or with slides, which also in this talk. I think that there's three things kind of worth saying from where, in terms of where I come from in this kind of work, because since I think it's quite uh, different to where, to where most people come from. So firstly, my, uh, my academic work is not in CS in the slightest. My uh, PhD was not in CS or anything even remotely close. And I think so in terms of design and how that will impact what players do within a game rather than some that that uh, takes place quite a lot is that people ask me CS questions and I just have them the foggiest clue what the hell they mean and I say I really don't I really don't know if I do that or not could you ask me a question about design or experience instead please so please don't ask those sorts of questions and that's basically how I imagine computer scientists talk so please don't ask me questions of that sort please ask me more kind of um, yeah the other kinds. And thirdly, uh, this is more a kind of work in progress of a game I make, and rather than a sort of more uh, standard kind of academic paper type thing. And so this is more sort of discussion based, and so do, uh, do please feel free to ask questions throughout the talk, and we'll see how it goes. Cool, so the outline is that I'll talk about the game, the game I make, which is URR, and uh, these four aspects of what the game's PC, PC, PCG systems do. And then some kind of con, and then some kind of uh, sum up of what I think makes this very kind of new and very distinctive, and where I think it can go from here. So very quickly, this is the game I make. Um, it's a eight-year roguelike project because um, I began this in the same year as my PhD, and clearly having one massive life-changing project was not enough for me. And uh, it's roughly kind of half to two-thirds done um, at this point. And there are three kind of main uh, goals to the game, which is firstly that, which if you've which if you've ever played. Uh, roguelikes, I'm assuming most people in the room will know what a roguelike is, but if you don't, it's a game which is basically based on a PCG world permadeath, meaning when you die you can't uh, reload, and kind of very high levels of, uh, of, uh, of um, complexity and challenge. Secondly, to do that, which is the focus of the talk, of course, and thirdly, to do that, which you'll see throughout the talk, and number two is that uh, a necessarily large bit of text says is the focus of this talk. So, very briefly, Mike, could you pass me the water? It's really boiling in here. Thank you. Um, yeah, so very, so, so um, extremely quickly, the, uh, the game soft and where creates a world which looks something like this, and it uh, piece CGs all the flags for different nations. And then if we zoom in on, say, one of these little uh, settlement blocks, then when we get something like that, so that's a city on the left and a town and then a fortress, and then if we zoom in on one of the kind of dis uh, um, tricks of that, then it will look like that, and then if we zoom in further, we get lots of buildings, so the game creates kind of uh, architectural styles for each for each kind of in-game culture, and then creates and then creates that uh, cultures build things based on that style, so that's a uh, a church, a hospital, a cathedral, a mint, a parliament, and a mansion, I think, in that order. And then if you zoom in, every uh, character here can then be uh, viewed in detail, and then you get PCG items, which look like that. So a piece of clothing, a chair, an altar, a grave, a vase, a uh, incense stand, a reliquary, and a tomb. And then the, uh, and then the uh, game world is also full of people, so you uh, have PCG. CG faces and clothing styles, and then there's a bunch of people walking around a cathedral. So um, a big part of this world is this idea that everything should have kind of meaning and sense, and that everything shouldn't go with the kind of word soup type model that a lot of the PCG games use, where uh, where when they want to name a town, they just pick two words and stick them, and then that's it. Or um, and basically a lot of these games they. They only make sense if you kind of place yourself within the mindset of someone expecting a world which is going to make kind of AI sense rather than human sense in a way. And the AI and the kind of main goal here is to make a world where it kind of functions how the real world does. In that, if you look at a if you look at a um, a clothing style, then you'll see some links there between that style and how that um, and how that culture uh, writes or or uh, how that culture makes makes uh, books and these sorts of things. 
So there are four big parts to this, which I'm going to talk about today, and the first is religion. So the game creates uh, PCG religions, and um, it starts off as just a symbol and, and a kind of set of um, beliefs held by that religious group, and these then spread around the world. And uh, for, the religious, for the religious beliefs, it creates these sorts of things. And these clearly other games have made these sorts of things, like, um, I guess, uh, I guess Dwarf Fortress is the most kind of obvious uh, of the game which makes um, concepts and makes religions like, like uh, this. Except the main kind of, kind of uh, split here I see is that the idea is that these beliefs are not kind of purely sort of world building detail, but that they kind of directly change what the player sees within the world, i.e. if you look throughout every kind of aspect of one religion, it should all make sense as a kind of cohesive whole, rather, rather, rather than just a list of things picked at random which don't uh, link up. And so for instance, the uh, game creates PCG uh, altars. There's something like 30 million religious altars that the game can uh, make, and these are based on five kind of uh, archetypes, I guess. So there's a kind of um, Lovecraft-esque one, there's a kind of Pantheon one, a, a a more kind of demonic-esque one, a more kind of animal-based one, and then a kind of standard one for anyone which won't fit into the previous five. And the kind of color and the kind of color schemes and the kind of patterns on these are then shown in things like uh, re um, religious clothes and books and uh, rituals and so forth. And so the idea here is that everything created for each, for each religious belief should in some way influence um, every, other, every other part of the same religion. And so this is a fairly simple example, but, it, but it's quite uh, vis visual, and so, I th and so I think it works well, in that that's a kind of religious robe, an altar, and, and a uh, prayer mat. And the game will never say when you kind of look at one thing, this is a prayer mat of religion X. Instead, it will only say, Thank you. Instead, instead, it will own, let me say, this is a prayer mat, and it's up to the player to kind of make uh, sense and link these things up and see what uh, is linked to what. Then languages, and this is the thing, or di that should say dialects, I guess, as they aren't really languages as such. But um, I've tried to move away from games which have NPCs which basically just say standard phrases, and I'm sure that a lot of you have played this. this these, these, are two these are two screenshots from... Um, Oblivion, and when you ask people things, they basically just say the exact same thing regardless of when the kind of in-game world they are based. And so the idea here was to create NPCs who do kind of truly vary based on their cultural uh, background. And so the I, uh, and this kind of is based on my uh, academic uh, work, which, like I say, is not in CS. And the point here is to kind of make worlds which have a lot of sort of cultural depth as well as purely kind of uh, making uh, spaces and buildings and uh, climates and so forth. And I think that there's also quite a lot of kind of gameplay uh, chance here in that if you can have a system whereby, say, if you can learn how to speak in the way a certain culture speaks, then you can blend into that culture, then I think that that sort of yields, uh, yields a lot of quite intriguing and quite new kind of gameplay uh, options. And also the uh, fourth reason is, is, is that this is quite new. And there's not, and there's, although there's a lot of NLP type stuff in games, there's not a lot of what I've taken to call di to calling a dialect gen, which is where the game creates a different way for each culture to speak. And then every sentence every, every person within that culture says is then different based on how they are meant to speak. And you'll see what I mean in a bit. So basically the game first does, does uh, this. And this is fairly uh, normal, I think, in that, uh, in that, uh, in that a large amount of, uh, PC, of PCG games do create kind of word uh, groupings. So, for instance, you get something like that. And so each culture will have uh, words and names and so forth which look like this. And, and the idea there is that, again, they should be similar enough that when you look at one and you've seen, say, that, that, and that, and then you see that, you should think, okay, it's more likely to be from this culture rather than from that culture, and so forth. But then, from that point on, I think it gets more um, distinctive, and I don't know of many other games which do these next uh, things. So one, so the game kind of takes uh, references for how people should speak based on where that culture is based. So it takes references from the land, from the history, from the religions of that place, Hello Simon, 
and from the uh, sort of houses and families who uh, live within that uh, world. And so you then get sentences like these, and these are all PCG'd by the game, and these are based on uh, the background of the nation of the person saying these things. And I'll just take a drink or three of those. And so the idea here is that when you hear someone say these things, even if you don't know what culture they are from before you hear them say it, once you read those, those should give you a slight kind of hint towards where they come from, assuming that you've been paying enough attention to the game to know what these things uh, refer to. I'm also quite a fan of the uh, last one at the bottom, if you haven't read that one. I think that's the best by far, it's fairly kind of insulting as well. Although we will get on to PCG insults in a minute. And then the next thing it does is names. So the game creates, so the game PCGs a method for creating names and then PCGs each name within that method which was itself uh, created. And the idea here is that names uh, like the kind of rest of the uh, stuff, stuff I talk about in this talk, is that names should be a hint towards where this pers where the person who who you are speak who you are speaking to in game uh, comes from. So, for instance, here are nine sets of names from nine different cultures, and so and so in each of these and, and so in each of these cases, the game came up with the method for creating these names, and then creates a bunch of names within this method. And so, everyone who you talk to from each culture will then have names that look like this. And so, the same kind of thing uh, runs here in that once you've seen those three, if you then meet someone with that name, you should kind of know. Okay, then this person is likely to come from this uh, place without ever. Um, Ex without ever explicitly being told, so the um, so the one in the top left is a kind of um, is a kind of uh, who is a kind of uh, Greek uh, name style. Um, the middle one is a kind of name and then a sort of title. Uh, this one is three names which then get shorter uh, and so on and so forth. And then uh, the game also for each for each uh, culture to create uh, insults and greetings and farewells and things of this sort. So the idea here uh, was that each insult should be based on the culture of that people, so that if it's so that if it's a culture which really values um, martial success, then they will insult you for being poor combat or something. So on the left hand side, you can see a bunch of greetings. In the middle, there's a bunch of farewells. On the sort of middle right, there's a bunch of uh, compliments. And then on this side, there's a bunch of threats based on each particular culture. And I have no idea how many how, uh, of these the game can make, but there's a, but there's a pretty large number anyway. <laughs> And then the final point is is, um, is kind of what I'm calling is uh, what I'm calling sentence complexity, which is that everything that someone says can be longer or shorter based on how kind of wordy people from their culture are. And so the idea here is that um, it adds it adds a kind of another it adds another layer of kind of detail and um, info to each in game culture, but but also, and I'm really hoping this is the next bullet point. It is splendid. Um, it's also intended as as a kind of game and play choice, in that if you if you if you if you have a finite length of time within the game, and you can say visit one of two uh, lands, and one has people who talk a lot, and one has uh, cheap goods, then which option do you take? As the former will lend more uh, info, whereas the where as in the um, other you can get more uh, bang for your buck. So, for instance, the same sentence. Um, across six different uh, lands will look like this. So it could just be that. Or if they are slightly more willing to kind of speak with you, then they'll say that. Or they might say that. Or they might say that. Or that. And so forth. And then this then, every single thing that someone within the game can say is then adjusted based on this. And so um, the next two slides, I think, show two examples of this, hopefully. Yeah, cool. So say you're talking with this bloke. Then you ask a bunch of questions. It could look like that. Hopefully that's readable. I think it should be, yeah. So that's for a really, really kind of wordy culture who like to talk a lot and who, give, and who kind of give a lot of um, info on what they say. So the ones on the left are the things that you said, and the ones on the right are the things that the uh, AI person has responded to. I'll just give that a second for you to read. So 
So all those lines are based upon this bloke's uh, history and religion and culture and background and where he comes from his history and blah, 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 blah. I'm sure you get the idea by now. By contrast, if you speak to someone who is far less um, verbose and you ask the same three things, then you get something like that, which is a slightly more uh, stark answer of just, hello, he lives there, he's strange. So there's also a kind of intriguing uh, question here, which is that, um, in fact, actually, it's easier if we just go back a second. Uh, here, there's, there's something like 500 or so standard things that you can ask, each of which is then turned into a sentence based on that person's uh, way of speaking. And the thing is, of course, players in general, in uh, most cases, like to play games extremely uh, perfectly. But if you have 500 choices in every conversation, and if it's a game about information, then people are going to want to exhaust every choice, of course. And clicking 500 things is not necessarily massively thrilling. So um, basically, the people who you talk to in game will will get bored of speaking with you extremely quickly unless you ask things which are which kind of make sense based on what they will want to speak about. And so there's a kind of gameplay uh, part here in that you have to ask people things which make sense that they would want to answer or that they would kind of at least feel comfortable-ish to speak about. Which is exactly what that final point says. And then uh, the third part is this. So um, I wanted to kind of move away from games like Civ and Civ and uh, Crusade Kings and things where you have these kind of political choices which affect kind of a single high level number. Like if you make this choice, then you gain plus two gold per town or you gain plus X votes per Y and these sorts of things. So, in, so instead I wanted a system which would make every nation distinct but that would kind of trickle down into how people behave and how the nation builds its buildings and how the nation thinks about itself and how it writes its own uh, works and so forth. And so the game creates a huge lot of uh, history and then creates the physical world based on that. And then um, I made a system whereby it started from the kind of Civ style thing. So here's a nice bunch of little pictures for various uh, political beliefs, and you're welcome to guess what they all mean. And it starts off with this, but then rather than the mere kind of plus two to gold per town and these sorts of things, instead these will affect what the player kind of phys physically sees in each world. So say if a nation um, is particularly army focused, then there will be a barracks in every town or something. Or if it's a very wealthy nation, then all the buildings will be swankier than in a poorer one and so forth. And so these kind of um, abstract ideological concepts affect the in-game world which the player sees, and I'm hoping that this bunch of eight GIFs will vaguely display this, but this is the player kind of going around a bunch of buildings. I think it's a a jail, a mansion, um, a town hall, a castle, a, a bunch of houses, a monastery, an embassy, and a church, I think. And these will all change based on what the uh, ideological background of that nation happens to be. And a really good um, example here is the game's castles. So the uh, game will make castles which are hugely varied based on the based on the ideological beliefs of the nation in question. And so you will have castles with uh, rooms with uh, trophies or with weapons or with uh, wealth or with um, religious stuff or with uh, tables and chairs or whatever it is based on what the nation deems to be particularly uh, crucial. And so the I am near here, and then this is the same kind of thing as the whole talk, is that you should shift these kind of rather than just making in-game ideas which then you can read in a book or you can look at some law and these sorts of things, that they kind of directly affect what the player sees in the world and that once the player knows, okay, this uh, land is very imperialist, then everything they, they see in terms of castles, in terms of books, in terms of how people talk, in terms of how they dress, in terms of how they fight, everything should reflect that same concept in some way, shape, or form. Oh, yes, and um, also, um, I came up with this idea that a lot of games, of course, use symbols, and some games even do things like PCG flags and so forth, but 
in the real world, of course, symbols don't have the same meanings for uh, everyone. So there's a system in place whereby the same symbols have different meanings across different cultures. And so there's quite a, quite a kind of fun little thing here in that if you, if, you, if you have a single symbol and one culture feels that it's a symbol of peace and one culture thinks it's a symbol of war and then they meet and they use the same symbol in different contexts, then you can get some fairly uh, fun occurrences based on those two different um, thoughts of the same symbol. So lastly, aesthetics. Um, a kind of crucial part of this is that each nation has its own set of kind of preferred aesthetic styles, which then affect everything within that uh, land, from how they build a building to, to, um, to how a vase looks, to how a book looks, and so forth. And so the, and, um, this began when I was doing the graphics for the most, for the most kind of uh, simple of things, i.e. chairs, and I thought, okay, can I make chairs that look different for each, for each land? Okay, yes, fine, that's not super impressive. But then could I have these same shapes then apply to the rest of the game world? And the answer, of course, is yes. So if you have a land which is particularly fond of octagons, then you will get things that look like this. And this is just a very kind of low-level basic change across each culture, but it still makes each culture kind of slightly distinctive again. And so things like uh, shape and color and patterns and so forth kind of, um, kind, of, uh, kind of repeat themselves across each nation. And then this expands into other examples. So here's a bunch of doors from different uh, lands, a bunch of relics, a bunch of incense stands, a bunch of buildings. So these are, so these are, all, uh, these are all mansions, but these are from different nations who happen to like to build their mansions in, diff in uh, different ways. And then clothing styles, also the uh, game can create something like uh, 60 million clothing styles, I think. And then these are then repeated across each nation and then they vary based on wealth and status and, and, uh, so, and so on and so forth. And the I and the here is the same one throughout the, throughout, the rest, through, throughout the rest of the talk, which is that these should give a kind of single coherent style. Although these six are all from different nations in case you're thinking, hang on, what's that got to do with that? Um, but the idea here is that every land should, should kind of have, should have its own kind of look and its own style and be consistent across kind of every thing that that particular nation creates. Yes, and so, and so the kind of goals here are one, that in that I think it's very, very important that, that kind of in-game worlds look more believable than just creating a bunch of objects and dumping them in there. And I think that in the real world, we do a, tr we do, uh, we do a huge amount of, of kind of work in terms of seeing how things link and seeing how styles of certain things and certain beliefs and so forth all link up. And I think this kind of, kind of thing in uh, games is really crucial, in fact. So, in conclusion, the uh, aim of the game is to be that. And I think it probably is that already, to be honest. But uh, if it's not, I, ver I uh, very much hope it will be soon. And the, and the main kind of method is by doing that and then having that kind of fill up to down so that everything that you see in game is based on these things rather than just picked and random. And the I um, here therefore is that, ev is that you should never encounter a thing in game, whether it's a castle or a chair or whatever, that has no meaning and no link to other stuff within that game world. So you sh should kind of all always feel kind of placed and positioned within a certain culture or a certain concept or certain uh, religion and so forth. And then also, and this is a more kind of academic goal, I guess, but I'm very concerned by games where you have a lot of diff different uh, lands, say, and then everyone just happens to, to speak the same kind of English across all these types of cultures. And I can see why they do that, of course, but I think that that's extremely dull, and I think that this kind of method can make a game feel more like you truly are in a world where people behave as they would within that world, rather, rather, rather than that, that kind of archetypal Middle English fantasy world where everyone speaks the same way regardless of where they come from. And then the final point is that, is that as well as the kind of background I think that this lets you do, there's also I think a lot of kind of gameplay uh, Val um, you here in that it lets you turn learning about the game world into a mechanic in its own right and that the more that you know about the world then the better choices you can make or the more that you can kind of fake that you belong to a certain culture and so on and so forth.
Thank you. All Let's try that again. Thank you all for listening. So it's it's a roguelike with permadeath. Yes. And information is very important. But what are you doing? The basic objective is to is to find a small number of things hidden within the game world. And you basically find them by learning about the game world and working out where they are based on what people say and what people talk about and where some things are built and these sorts of things. So you have to learn about the game world in order to succeed in the game, basically. Mm. And if you die, and this is the really fun bit, if you die, as well as the player being permadeath, the world is as well. So the world is completely wiped as soon as you die, meaning that there will be lands and so forth that no one ever sees, which I think is rather pleasing, actually. And I know that I sent this to you about the uh, book chapter as well, didn't I? Mm. In the beginning, you talked about generating the symbols. Yes. Do, do they have any, like, is there a link between the, the shape of the symbol, mm. being a symbol, and the illusion that? Uh, yes. I, I, it's 20 slides ago. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, so um, a religion with five gods is more kind of like only to have a five sort of things within their thing and so, and, um, so forth. Not completely, though, because there's, there's all sort of thing in there to make sure that every symbol looks very unlike every other symbol within one world. So if, say, there, there happen to be ten religions who all have five gods, then there's only so many ways that you can have five things with, with in a kind of small grid and so forth. Some it'll just say, okay, I can't do this and pick another, sim um, pick, um, another thing instead. And what's the seed? Like, where does the generation start? Um, it starts... I, I had quite a bit of trouble with that because I was... A f because, of course... In the perfect world, one would start off with, say, people evolving and then tiny little uh, groupings and so forth. But then that, I'm quite kind of aware of this idea that I think a lot of games which do kind of very heavy piece CG stuff are more concerned by making a cool system rather than concerned by, by what the player sees in the experience of that system. So I basically just magically create a, a, create a nation at world gen and then, go, and then go from there. And by the time the player plays, the start, the start of that nation is so well hidden that you can never tell that it just popped into existence, basically. Uh, what is kind of interesting related to that is that what if a nation is highly fiat mm. and then it has a religion that favors five gods, mm. and, and yet your aesthetics of that, those two roles are octagons? Mm. So shouldn't it be pentagon? Where is the inspiration? Yes. The, there are certain points at which, you, at which you just can't link things up just because there's only so many things that can be linked and so forth. But I try not to have it. I think the bad outcome would be where there's a huge bunch of things linked and there's a bunch of things that's not. Instead, I see it more as kind of a bunch of circles. So everything within a circle will always be linked to at least one other circle in a kind of chain. So even if A and Z are not linked, A will be linked to D and D's linked to G and G's linked to Z and so forth. So you can still kind of trace it all back to the same thing even if certain aspects like that, you just can't link up. So you mentioned uh, the amount of words that these characters uh, would like to speak. Mm. Uh, do they also lie? And oh, yes, they yes. Change by the culture? Uh, yes. Um, different cultures are more willing to lie or speak the truth. Some are sexist, some are racist in various ways. Um, some will be more or less inclined to talk to strangers. Um, yeah. Sorry? So you, you have many different figures. Uh, what are the things that the cultures that differ by? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, there's... Yeah, there's something like... Um, yeah, sure. Um, there's the main kind of ideology aspect. There's those sorts of things. There's something like... Um, in terms of, sort of substantial things, there's uh, about 50 or so at the core, but the nature of those can vary. So what, so what one religion considers to be kind of... Sorry, um as in two nations which are both very army-focused, will be army-focused in different ways, basically. So each then kind of, kind of, then, uh, sp each then kind of splits up into more, and then each of those splits into more, and uh, so forth. I've never had two nations created which are same-ish. I did, I did once uh, have, have a nation created which, which, which was basically the um, British Empire from the 1800s or so, in, in that it had the right flag, it had everything right in terms of what it felt about the rest of the world and so forth. It had a kind of tiny little homeland and then a massive um, uh, colonies and so forth. 
But after that, I put in a system whereby I can't create a nation which is too much like a real world nation. So uh, that can no longer happen happily. So how often does the game surprise you? So how often yes. does the, the game generate something that you have created hmm. think, wow, I didn't know yeah. you I mean, yeah, uh, I, speaking A as the person who's made them, B more crucially in a way that as the person who tests it, so clearly I see thousands and thousands of things each day. But I'd say if, I'm, if it's a day I'm spending a full day coding and testing, I'd say at least once a day we'll come up with something I didn't expect, or maybe once every other day, something like that. Um, I had a good one a while back where I it created a nation where its home city took up the entire island it lived on, and I hadn't anticipated that that could happen, but the game could kind of handle it and, and made it this sort of Venice-esque kind of naval trading type thing. And so I was quite pleased that the game had been able to kind of pick up that and run with it rather than think, oh God, there's nowhere near the city, what do we do, crisis. So that does happen occasionally. Um, it happens more, excuse me, it happens more often now with all the lang, uh, with all the uh, lang, um, lang and ridge stuff in there, but that's just because that's, that's new and therefore I'm still seeing what it can do. So yeah, every now and then. <laughs>